Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for connecting to this class. The recording has started. We can pray and begin this morning. Uh, let me just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for another new day. And Lord, your mercies in our lives, Father, which are new every morning. Father God, as we take time in your word, we pray that, Lord, you will help us uh, anchor our lives, God, uh, to the word of God, which is eternal. Strengthen us, Lord. Establish us and enable us, O God, to live for the glory of your name. Father, we speak blessings upon all the faculty. We speak blessing upon all the students and their families. Father, commit uh, every single person into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's proceed uh, with he the book of Hebrews. Yesterday, we talked about moving towards maturity in God in Hebrews chapter 5. And then we went to Hebrews chapter 6 which is warning us about falling away. We just started uh, that section and we had identified who it was talking about. Uh, it is very clearly talking about a born again, spirit filled believer. And the text is suggesting that there is a possibility of a believer in Christ going away from God. Okay, so that was what we were discussing. Uh, so this morning, once again, let's go back to that text. We were at uh, verse 4, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, uh, all the way till verse 8. So let me just leave this uh, time open to discuss about uh, falling away. Are there any questions from our side? about somebody going away from God. It's not falling. Instead, it is falling away. And yesterday, I had clarified the difference between the two. Falling is to come short of uh, God's standard sometimes in our walk with the Lord as believers. Because you know we may, may fail. We may have shortcomings. But as long as sincerely we are coming back to the Lord with a repentant heart and uh, setting our lives right uh, before him, it's OK. That's the journey of every believer and overcoming life. But falling away means somebody who has gone away from God completely. OK? And uh, they have, uh, we could even say, rejected Christ. So that is the status. So any questions regarding that? Uh, I have a question. So, um, about the preachers nowadays, when they preach, and they preach so good, and then uh, we hear some false accusations sometimes later of their life, which are quite serious accusations even, uh, which one of the worst thing I've heard is some abuses that they have. Okay. Um, so, what happens to their soul? Do they really get saved or they are forgiven? Uh, that's one of the questions I have. They fell away or they just, I don't know. Yeah, I know it's uh, it really affects us as believers when we hear such stories of uh, mighty men and women of God. You know, suddenly, there are these stories about them not living a godly life. See, ultimately, I think one is known by the fruit of uh, their faith and their ministry. So we can observe the fruit of their lives uh, and their ministry and see whether it is really leading people to Christ. Uh, if yes, then we know that they were a true minister of God. But if it's not, um, the Bible also shares that in the last days there will be those um, but we'll come to it when we study the book of Second Peter and the book of Jude, that there would be some who call themselves as ministers of God who were actually not uh, born again, who were actually not of God in the first place. So there is a possibility for something like that to happen. But in the case of uh, you know a minister of God who was doing so well and doing everything uh, right, glorifying God, and then they went wrong, 
it's very difficult for us from the outside to really judge uh, and and say that oh will they be with god or how will god i think it would be between god and them because now there are all these comments that people have before us which some maybe they can be verified some cannot be so it's very difficult for us to judge and say what happened whether they died in christ or they didn't we don't know. only in heaven we know i suppose yeah is that okay jafina does it make sense okay sure yeah good question y yes zeli please go ahead um like uh, i have a question um uh, one of my friend uh, that person backslided okay and uh, that person also wants to come to the lord again but what i heard from that person is that uh, the mentors uh, uh, they're not fully supporting him like they just that that person and uh, that person is isolated and uh, i heard from that person that uh, uh, the mentors you know uh, you uh, what to, uh, what to say like uh, instead of uh, encouraging that person they are just uh, uh, i heard you know like uh, very negative comments about that very person and he was so hurt with that uh, mentors that uh, he uh, that person left the church so in that situation like as a friend i'm so uh, concerned about that very person so how can i encourage that person so that he uh, that person will be built up in the faith and you know restored back from the, uh, 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 from the friend's perspective i just want to know that yes thank you zeli that's a uh, very you know like a um a real situation and struggle that somebody could be having uh, and i can share some of my own thoughts uh, if we look at um, james chapter 5 james chapter 5 from verse 19 it says brethren if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins so when we find somebody who's gone away from god our responsibility is to help bring them back when we look at hebrews chapter 6 you know where it says uh, it is impossible for someone you know who has tasted of god so wonderfully uh, and if they fall away to renew them again to repentance it's talking about an extreme situation okay uh, and this is not the norm and i i don't think we can quantify this but just for our understanding uh, i i would say something like you know in 99.9% when believers repent and they want to come back to god they are, can be restored but this would probably be you know maybe 0.1% or if you want to bring that number down 0.01% it could even be you know that uh, a fewer number uh, that this particular passage is talking about so when in our everyday scenario we find that some of our friends uh, our loved ones have gone away from god uh, instead of applying what we read in hebrews 6 we can consider passages like james 5 which is which talks about bringing back someone okay turning them away from their error and uh, saving their soul so uh, we must do that for our friends so zeli um, good that you're thinking about it and you want to help your friend uh, in this situation now how to do it I think Galatians six uh, also has something nice to tell us. So let me just quickly quote it. Okay, so Galatians chapter six, verse one, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So it is telling us to. uh help them with a spirit of gentleness meaning we 
see their weaknesses we understand what could be going wrong and instead of accusing them condemning them pulling them down tearing them apart we in a spirit of meekness we very humbly try to guide them now this does not mean that we don't speak the truth to them because the same bible also tells us that we must speak the truth in love right so don't hide their faults um we need to let them know what they did wrong but do it in a gentle way do it in such a way that it could really help that person come back to god so does that help personally uh yes that was helpful uh but that very person like uh, whom i mentioned like um that person was saying like okay i have uh, fallen i admit that i fallen i uh, mean you know but uh that person said i'm very much disappointed with my mentors you know instead of encouraging me now do they have just let me uh, let him on his own and they are not trying to communicate with that very person so like as a friend i can uh, uh, uh feel what he, uh, that person is going through you know like he's uh, like that person is like kind of isolated uh mm. in that way mm. so yeah from the uh, again from the friend's perspective you know how can i encourage uh, that very person more so that you know he will fellowship with other like minded believers okay so um see if if at all the mentors are rejecting him at this point and not helping him come back that is very sad uh however we don't know though your friend is stating that the mentors are not taking me back we don't know if there are there uh, have conversations have taken place where uh, your friend is probably uh, you know not willing to listen to the mentors maybe they've said something and your friend is not willing to do it we don't know there could be a lot of things that are unsaid all right so what i would suggest is i would suggest uh, that your friend you can encourage your friend to approach the mentors and uh, to like maybe state to the mentors and say hey i am sorry and uh, i uh, could you please give me a chance be repentant uh, before the mentors that will be helpful at least it will help them know that uh, this person is making a turn around okay so that might be a good thing to do but even after letting them know very clearly that this individual wants to come back to god if they are not helping then i think uh, he or she may only have to strengthen themselves in the lord by on their own uh, and uh, let the spirit of god the word of god uh, wash them restore them and i believe that as they are seeking the lord god will bring uh, good godly people into their life to speak and uh, sort of you know revive refresh restore them once again Okay, thank you, Pastor. That was helpful. Okay, okay. Thanks, Zeli. Thank you. It it is quite challenging, uh, and from uh, what I have observed, you know, in in whatever little bit of ministry experience that I have, I feel when when people want to come back to God, uh, working with them. uh it it's it is quite challenging especially the part where where as someone who's working with them you help them know that you are for them you're not against them and what they did doesn't stop you from uh you know helping them out for them to be convinced of it is quite difficult like they sometimes carry so much of shame that they are not able to uh be back in the kind of relationship that uh, you know they had with their leaders or with their mentors earlier but yes uh, as we speak to them pray for them and affirm them again and again and say hey hey don't worry about what has happened you know you can make a change and uh, let's work together hopefully hopefully both the person and the mentor can come to a place where 
uh, from where they go forward. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, very practical issues there, and good. It's good that we are talking about it. Anything else to discuss before we get back into the passage? Okay, uh, so with regard to helping those who have uh, fallen away from God or dealing with uh, conflicts, I think uh, there is content in the book Kingdom Builders. Quite elaborately, Pastor writes about these matters. So I encourage you to go read that. Um, and uh, coming back to the text here from Hebrews chapter 6, that is uh, pointing out somebody who has fallen away. Okay, uh, they have rejected God. Now, again, you know, some questions that people ask is if the grace that God has given is so immense, um, then why? How can people fall away? Because Christ has already paid for our sins, uh, and no matter what somebody has done, they can find redemption. You know, amidst that. You see, this falling away, uh, generally, this would happen if the individual rejects Christ. Okay, And that's what verse 8, um, sorry, uh, verse 6 says here. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So how do these individuals crucify the Son of God? By living in their sin willfully. So when something like that happens, it is the will of the person to reject the finished work of the cross. Otherwise, you see, the redemption bought by the work of by Jesus on the cross is so powerful and uh, uh, you know so generous, uh, immense that anyone who's repenting can come under that grace, isn't it? But why is it not happening for the person who's falling away? Because they are willfully rejecting it. That's the only way to you know, keep uh, the, the power of God, the cleansing work of the blood of Jesus out of our lives. So that's the kind of person that this falling away passage is talking about. Uh, OK, so it also says here that they put him to an open shame. That means that what an individual who's away from God is doing is they, uh, we, we say, right, like the life that God has given us is to glorify and honor him. So someone who's fallen away from God are going in their own way. So there's no glorifying God. There's probably glor glorifying self and pleasure and you know all sorts of things. Now moving on to the next two verses here, verse 7 and 8, uh, it simply states, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So what does this mean? It's in continuation uh, to what we said about somebody who's fallen away. So then what does it mean, this passage? It, it, means what it states. It says that when the rain comes down on the earth, uh, the, the uh, plants bear good fruit. Uh, and uh, that's how it's supposed to be, right? When the blessing of God, the, the spirit of God at work, we're supposed to produce fruit for God. That's the normal way of, of uh, the natural process. But let's say the rains come but ultimately you find thorns briars then that is sort of you know uh, it says it is rejected and near to being cursed god doesn't want that rather uh, god rejects fruitlessness and we know uh, the passage in john chapter 15 where the scriptures talk about we being the branches of the vine we bear fruit and how does the father work on us. He prunes us to bear fruit. So every life 
must bear fruit for God. If there is a life that does not bear fruit for God, that's something that God rejects. And that's what he's saying here. Someone who's fallen away, living willfully in sin and putting God to public shame, right? Uh, and not glorifying God. That's not the kind of life that God wants us to have. And there is a warning. We've been seeing this throughout uh, the passages of the book of Hebrews that the writer is warning that in any given situation, uh, don't allow yourself to be in a place where you reject God and uh, you, know, you uh, let go of the faith that you have. All right. So let's move on. We'll go to the next section here. We'll go uh, go ahead with the reading verse 9 to verse 12. Can one of us please read it? Verse 9. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and, to, and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. Okay, it's like a father talking. Uh, at one point, he's very stern, he's very direct, and he talks about uh, matters that are quite difficult to digest, things like falling away. And again, you know, he comes back so gently, but he says, hey, but it's not you. I'm not saying that you did it. Uh, okay, but uh, yeah, you... You're a, uh, you've done so well. So a little bit of encouragement mixed with uh, the earlier warning that came across. So from verses 9, he says, but beloved, so you see how uh, with that endearing word, he encourages them once again, lest the people become fearful and, uh, uh, you know, they, they go away from God. So he says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. And it, it's as if he's saying, but don't worry, you know, this won't happen to you. Uh, you will do better with your faith. Uh, we are confident about better things about you. Um, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Now, again, a word of encouragement, verse 10. It seems like the Hebrew believers, they had a good testimony. They were serving God faithfully. And that's why in verse 10, he says, see, God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. Uh, and he adds there that they had ministered to the saints. So um, we recognize that it was a very hospitable community. And in those days, it is said that when ministers of God went from city to city, town to town, uh, they would stay back in the homes of believers in that place. So the Hebrew believers uh, might have taken care of you know, preachers and believers and others who were traveling, traveling ministers. So he's encouraging them and saying, look, you've done so well. You have served God faithfully and uh, God is a good God. He recognizes the work that we do for him. And uh, he says that God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love. OK, so that's so beautiful. That's a word of encouragement for all of us today. Uh, I know that all of us in various capacities, we are serving the Lord in our own local churches uh, and uh, any opportunity that God gives us. Uh, always know that God is faithful. He'll not forget. It says he's not unjust to forget your work. You know, sometimes when we work so hard for the Lord and uh, maybe we are tired or we are discouraged, that's that people didn't affirm us, they didn't praise us, or, you know, there can be all kinds of reasons. One thing that we can encourage ourselves with is that God sees it, okay? And he is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. Uh, and I really love that uh, passage. I think it's in Romans, it says that uh, there's no partiality with God. So if there's any one of us serving him, 
he is faithful enough to bless our lives at the right time you know the blessings will flow so with that assurance we can serve him don't worry about people recognizing or people affirming i uh, praise god you know sometimes people see our work and they say oh well done so good and all but then there are other times that nobody may know how we are serving god but stay encouraged uh, because god is just god is faithful god is not partial god is a rewarder and he also says labor of love so it tells us that when we love god when we love people uh, there is some uh, exertion there some uh, strain some putting in effort right and maybe at times we have to go out of our way and that that's uh, giving us the understanding of labor labor is what when we see someone um, striving in the sun working hard we say hey look how they are laboring so even in the ministry there will be times when we labor but it's a, let it be a labor of love you know, let it not be a labor of complaining oh god why should i do this you know why did you ask me to do all these things if it's a labor of love which we do towards god and for his people uh, there is a blessing and uh, that blessing will not miss us okay that assurance we can carry so it's a beautiful encouraging passage or a scripture here hebrew 6:10 i'll read it again for us for god is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister so he's encouraging the believers and saying good job you're doing well keep it up and god will reward you for it and going on to verses 11 and 12 it's an encouragement to continue in god and receive the promises of god into their lives so he says um uh we we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end okay and verse 12 that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises so he saying starting off on a journey is so good but finishing is even better okay the problem is when we give up midway and uh, no matter what is going on in our lives let's have this focus that we move on with diligence until the end keep that faith alive hope alive until the end okay that should be our goal as believers yes i started wonderfully but i have to finish finishing is very very important finishing well uh, is so very important okay so that's uh, the focus that he wants to bring to the believers and he says that see that you don't become sluggish okay but like those who have inherited the promises of god how did the people in uh, the bible inherit the promises of god we'll come to it we'll come to a beautiful passage hebrews 11 where we'll have the list of so many different people who walked into the promises of god okay of various kinds how did they do it he shows us two elements one is faith of course without faith it's impossible to please god without faith it's impossible to uh, serve god the way he wants to be served but secondly patience right patience where we are continuing through the struggles and through the difficulties we need both faith sometimes we have lot of faith but zero patience it won't work and sometimes we are just persevering patience but no faith will god do something i don't know i am just doing the right thing it, it's showing that we lack faith in god but both of these are so necessary have faith and also have patience these are the two things that have he- helped people to walk into the promises of god and we can be those people whatever it is that god wants us to accomplish in our lives as long as we journey with these two things we will be able to step into those promises but if we are discouraged then what happens uh it, it seems like that in what the writer is saying here maybe the people were serving god and going through um the opposition the persecution the lack and uh, they became discouraged 
what can discouragement do to the service of a minister or a believer? The writer says here, sluggish. Sometimes we become so, so uh, weary where we are serving, but there's no passion, there's no zeal, there's no hope in our serving. We are doing because it's the right thing to do. But God does not want that attitude. Okay, So the writer is telling them, yeah, I know you're, you're discouraged, but don't allow that to make you sluggish. Continue to uh, trust that God is not unjust. He will surely reward us. Okay, And uh, with faith, with patience, like those who have already inherited the promises of God, let's keep our lives in check and aligned. All right, let's move on now to the next section here. Again, he's talking about how faithful God is. So that's the essence of the next section. Uh, could somebody please read from verse 13 to verse 18? For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show how abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So along what we are saying now, encouraging them to have faith and patience, don't become sluggish because of your discouragement. He goes on to uh, tell us how firm and certain God's word is. So he takes us back to the promise that God made to Abraham. And when God said something to Abraham, okay, what was the, the uh, word that he stated here in verse 14? It says, surely blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply you. Uh, we also notice that there was nobody else required to um, back up God's word at that time. Okay, uh, God's word was enough by itself. So today we we understand that when we are stating something about ourselves, you know, sometimes we have to get it uh, authorized by a, a lawyer. You know, some statement that one has made or a change of name or a change of uh, place, but it needs uh, an authorization by you know a legal body or a, a, a or a person in authority. Only then it becomes valid. But when it comes to God. Whatever he says, it's so certain, it's so true. We don't even have to worry. And at the time when God blessed Abraham and said, look, Abraham, I am going to bless you. I am going to multiply you. There was no need for uh, you know a, a backup of any sort by anyone else because God's word is true in itself. Okay, it, it has integrity in it, in itself. And... Uh, Going back to the example of Abraham in verse 15, it says that Abraham, he received the promise of God. He was very blessed. Uh, his children, his descendants were very blessed. Uh, but how did that happen? It just did not happen only by faith. Yes, Abraham is our father of faith. But we also know about his patience. There were instances 
you know, where he had to uh, trust God, wait on the Lord. 25 years, he waited for one son. And even after that son came, there was a test given to him. He uh, trusted God enough to uh, sacrifice Isaac. So there are many other things in the life of Abraham that reveal his patience to us. So it's a reminder for us as believers. You know, sometimes we feel God is not moving fast enough, quick enough. But there are examples in the word of God for us who took God at his word. And they had faith in God. They also employed patience. And that's when they actually walked into the promises of God. And we too should be patient. Exercise our faith, but be patient. Surely God God is true. His word is true. Uh, and it says here uh, that, you know, uh, in verse 17, notice it says, the. okay, I'll read the whole passage. Thus God determined to show more abundantly, abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So immutability of his counsel refers to uh, how unshakable. God's word is what he said. It stands. Okay. So it's immutable. It cannot be changed. It's very sure. It's very pure. And in verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So once again, we are told that God, God's word is certain. That's the essence. I'm just going with the essence of what this passage is saying, that God's word is true. Stay focused on it. Be confident about it. Surely it will happen. Uh, and have patience. Okay. Uh, right. Verse 19, which says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. So, uh, this is revealing to us the function of hope or hoping in God. In moments of discouragement, one of the first things that gets affected is our hope. We just become so hopeless. What We don't have any hope for the future, uh, for good things to happen in our lives. So that is the nature of discouragement. It, just sucks the hope out of our lives. But the author is encouraging the believers that we need to have hope. If there's no hope in life, uh, we are like a ship that is floating, you know, in, in the sea or the ocean, no direction. We're just like, okay, we exist here right now. There's no storm, so I'm still there. When the storm happens, I don't know what's going to happen. In that kind of a life we may have in God, but that's not what God wants for us. We've all got to live with hope. So today, I just want to uh, ask us this question. What is the hope that we carry in our hearts for ourselves, our personal uh, growth, our family life, our finances? Is there any hope? Do we have any hope? Are we hoping that you know, we are heading towards this or one day it will be like this uh, in my home, in my family, in my health, in my ministry, in my church. Uh, I hope there is hope, okay? Because if there is no hope, then what does this scripture say? It says, there's no anchor for the soul. Hope is the anchor of the soul. We've got to have hope in our soul, birthed by God. When we have that, then what happens, there, there is some grip right, that we have in our lives, uh, for our soul. Uh, and uh, uh, it's also saying, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. So it, it's kind of, uh, I, I've heard somebody say this when this last portion, right? It says, which enters the presence behind the veil. It is talking about the um, the holy of holies in the temple worship there was a place where one would go into the presence of god and that is the holy of holies and here it says that hope is the anchor of the soul first of all it gives us some steadiness 
in our life. Secondly, our hope is felt in the presence of God, or rather, God feels it. God senses our hope, is what the author is saying. Okay, so it's very beautiful. When we are in the presence of God, God also senses what we are carrying in our hearts, what we are believing Him for in our hearts. And the author is saying, don't become so discouraged that there is no hope. You know, there's no sense of um, uh, that steadiness in God, where we are trusting that surely one day all these things are going to take place in different areas of my life. And even in the presence of God, in the very presence of God, when we encounter God, God also senses that hope that we carry and uh, that hope that makes us steady. So keep hope alive. It's so beautiful. We can talk so much about this passage. It says, it's the anchor. It's the anchor. Hope gives us steadiness. If you've ever looked at stories of people who've gone through maybe a, a huge crisis in their lives, Okay. But when uh, people keep hope alive in the crisis situation, maybe they lost all their finances, but as long as they have hope, we hear stories of them rebuilding their whole, uh, you know, their company and their business uh, and uh, once again shining. Or maybe something happened in their family, but they stand up again and they're able to see God work. But what if a person loses hope because of the crisis? The discouragement. It's very unfortunate. They may not be able to do much because they've lost the anchor itself. It's quite dangerous actually to, to live hopelessly without uh, having our hope in God. And later we will see when we come to Hebrews 11, we'll see that hope is the precursor of faith. Because in Hebrews 11, 1, we'll see faith is the substance of things hoped for. So there's got to be some things that we are hoping for. If we are not hoping for anything, there's no question of faith. So hope is attached to faith. And, uh, uh, you know, there's got to be hope in our lives. And godly hope, not just fantasizing you know, about different things. Okay. And uh, verse 20, he says, Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So going back to the temple worship practices, we know that the high priest was the one who was permitted to go into the Holy of Holies. Um, but in our case, Jesus being our eternal high priest, our high priest forever, has already gone into the presence of God. And the word forerunner is used uh, because forerunner in military terms is a person who goes ahead of everybody else and the others follow. So what did we read? Our high priest has gone up into the presence of God. That's something we've seen earlier in the book of Hebrews. He's gone into heaven itself, the very presence of God. And that's the high priest whom we have. He's already gone into the presence of God. And he's the one who leads us into the presence of God. Uh, and uh, when we call him the forerunner as a high priest, uh, which order does he belong to? We've talked about this earlier as well. He's of the order of Melchizedek. Okay. So uh, I'll stop right here. If there's any discussions regarding what we have spoken so far, we can, uh, you know, Take that up. If not, we can pray and close. And we'll start with ch uh, chapter 7 in the next class. Uh, I just want to know if I'm understanding it right. Uh, in verse 17, it says, uh, sorry, in verse 18, it says that by two immutable things. So in verse 17, it says immutability of his counsel and confirmed by a move. So the two immutable things are the council and the oath. Am, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you for asking that question. So uh, in verse 17, as of the prom as of promise, the immutability of his council, okay, immutability of his council is separate from what 
verse 18 is talking about over here. Okay. Now coming to verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Uh, so once again, <laughs> I'm going to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, immutability of his counsel. Okay, so there are two things that we can uh, anchor our faith to. One, I think you're right. It is the promise of the immutability of his counsel. Okay, immutability of his counsel. And second is, it is impossible for God to lie. So two things. One is the word of God and the second is the character of God. So the immutability of his promise is that God's word is truth. Whatever he says is truth. Secondly, in God's character, he cannot uh, you know, do anything that's evil, one of which is lie. So based on his word and based on his character, we can have hope in God. Okay, so sorry for that confusion. OK, so all this is just encouraging us to have hope in God. And hope is the anchor of the soul. Uh, and hope goes into the presence behind the veil where our forerunner, Lord Jesus, has also gone. And he's of the order of Melchizedek. Fine. So if that's the last question, we can pray and close up. OK, let's pray. Uh, I would like to request someone from our class to please lead in prayer. Anyone who can unmute and pray, please. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the session that we had. We thank you for the teachings that we went through. Help us to have patience and hope in you along with faith so that we may please you in our walk with you. We also thank you for, for our dear Pastor Nancy. We ask you to bless her even more and keep her in good health as she serves you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you, everyone. Uh, God bless you. We'll get back into our classes next week. So, yeah. See you then. Bye.